Good afternoon. Um, thank you for uh, the introduction and having me here. It seems to be like an intimate group of people, but uh, that may room leave us more room for discussion. Um, the title given to me was Rest of the Future, and I thought about what exactly would determine our future uh, when it comes to you know, applying breast MRI in clinical practice. And uh, after thinking about it, I thought the most important issue that will determine our future is the integration of MR imaging, breast MR imaging in general, <clears throat> or um, I think radiology in general even, into what people call value-based healthcare. The problem here is that the organizers of value based healthcare, the ones who determine what exactly value is, don't regard diagnosis as an outcome. It's just a step towards an outcome. And they consider diagnosis only if it's wrong, in other words, false positive diagnosis or complications. So to start at the end, my conclusion is the future of breast MRI will depend on whether we will succeed in integrating breast MRI into clinical trials that demonstrate its value. That is going to be of key importance. If we fail to do this, we're not going to prevail. Uh, a clinical trial is defined as a research study in which human subjects are systematically and prospectively assigned to an intervention, which can be a diagnostic test or also treatment, of course, to evaluate the effects of this intervention on health-related biomedical or behavioral outcomes. That's the broad definition of a clinical trial. Value-based healthcare says to justify the use of imaging, proof of diagnostic accuracy per se is not enough. As I said, a diagnosis is not considered a value, <laughs> surprisingly. Instead, the medical community asks for proof on improved outcome. Clinical trials address outcome endpoints beyond diagnostic accuracy, which is why I mentioned them. Now, there are three different areas, so to speak, where we can use breast MRI uh, in general, and they are listed here. We can use it in the preoperative situation to help improve surgical outcome of women who undergo surgery for an operable breast cancer. We can use MRI to monitor response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy, uh, or in general, treatment, non-surgical treatment, to know about whether the treatment is going to work, to adjust treatment to the responsiveness of tumors, but also for drug development, as we will see. And then, of course, we can use breast MRI for breast cancer screening, uh, which is going to be the application I'm going to focus on this evening during the Mansfield lecture. Um, outcome metrics um, that are useful to describe what we do are related to the type of clinical application. In other words, they differ regarding screening and treatment planning, of course. In a screening situation, the task is to find a cancer, which can be parameterized as the cancer detection rate and the interval cancer rate. Um, another metric, the actual outcome metric, so to speak, is mortality of individuals who um, participate in the screening um, endeavor compared to those who don't. Treatment planning can be dis distinguished between surgical outcome, does, is surgery successful by surgical means, and oncological outcome, which is quality of life, recurrence-free survival, and overall survival. Now, surgical outcome or reexcision rates or positive margin rates are the typical parameters chosen here in clinical trials that deal with MRI for treatment planning. Now, this paper was published as an editorial in 2015 and is entitled Re-Excision, the Other Breast Cancer Epidemic. What the author tries to explain is that there's an urgent clinical need to avoid repetitive surgery in women who undergo um, breast cancer treatment. So far, as you know, um, people or women are operated on um, as often as is needed until clear margins are achieved. And that can take not only one, but several re rates or rounds of re -excisions. And the authors of this editorial said, 
Even a reduction of re-excision rate by 10 percentage points could result in reoperations being avoided in the US alone of 10,000 to 20,000 women annually. So there's an urgent clinical need to avoid re-excision. This paper here um, is from uh, 2012 and summarized the reoperation rates, spontaneous reoperation rates that were observed in the United Kingdom in women with operal breast cancer who underwent breast conserving surgery. Um, authors uh, looked at uh, over 55,000 women and found that the reoperation rates overall was over 20%. One out of five women undergoes more than one round of surgery to obtain clear margins. And that these reoperation rates were even higher over almost one out of three women, 30%, once DCIS is involved, either because pure DCIS is treated or DCIS components of invasive breast cancers are present. The authors, notably no radiologists, not even a radiologist involved as a co-author here, say conclude lack of accurate imaging, especially of DCIS and of DCIS components of invasive cancers is the main reason for positive margins and repetitive surgery. You would say, wow, green card for imaging methods that improve this, right? <clears throat> now we know that um, mammography falls short to document the true extent of breast cancer and we have known this for decades now. This is not new. Um, this is a clinical case. The patient has a very small group of uh, clustered calcifications in the inner quadrant back in the dorsal aspect of her breast. This is her digital full field mammogram. This is her MRI that shows the true extent of the DCIS that occupies the entire inner quadrant and reaches up to involve also the nipple. This patient has an obvious bifocal invasive cancer on this C view of a TOMO image, but only MRI shows this DCS component that is that adds to the actual extent of the cancer by doubling the true extent that requires excision. And this DCS component is not visible on mammography whatsoever. Now, mapping local extent is not the only task for us as radiologists. The other task is to make sure this, that the information that we collect by imaging, for instance, MR imaging, to also enter the operating room. Because it is very difficult for the surgeon to translate this imaging information into procedures. One reason to this is that during the MRI acquisition, the patient is on her stomach in a prone position, whereas during surgery, she is laying on her back with the arm extended, which completely changes the anatomy of the breast, but also, of course, the location of the tumor within the breast. So it is very difficult for surgeons to use imaging information and exploit this to avoid positive margins. It is our task as radiologists to ensure that this happens. And the atavistic way, if you want, we use this or we, we, uh, we use to make this, um, to ensure this, is by doing localization procedures. Like in her case, this is a 63 year old patient. She has had reduction of mammoplasty 10 years ago. So, she, quite some architectural distortion almost everywhere, on peu partout, as one would say here, I think. Um, now, this is a biopsy-proven breast cancer, which is beautifully visible on this mammogram, in spite of the architectural distortions. The true extent is actually only visible with MRI, as you see here, and it's far greater than what mammography suggests. Now, if we want to get this into the operating room and have or allow, allow the surgeon to re-identify the margins of disease, we place guide wires along the tumor inside that you know, uh, index tumor and then along this banana shape disease extent to then make sure that the surgeon knows where to cut. This is the specimen radiogram obtained after MO-guided um, 
localization preoperatively. And as you see, there's no actually correlate for all these small tumor invasive foci on the mammogram whatsoever. But what you also see is that all the, the, the guide wires are included in the resection margin. And the patient had an R0 resection at first try. And this patient came back two years after treatment. And this is her now after treatment with her breast conserved and without tumor. This is the way it should be. It is MRI to depict disease extent and then MR guided surgery to ensure appropriate resection. We know um, since decades, as I said, the first results stem from a time as early as 1999 that um, MRI is far superior to mammography. There's not a single trial that would state the opposite. All trials are concordant in that MRI is far superior and that the additional diagnoses made by MRI have an impact on surgical management. Impact on surgical management so far had been considered the holy grail of what you can prove as a radiologist. Yeah, we have impact on surgical management, right? Now, we know it is far more accurate and we know it impacts surgical management in a substantial number of cases. Why, well, yeah, but um, not enough today. The medical community asks for outcome studies and says the outcome metric, if you want appropriately, is reaccession rates because that is the clinical problem, right? Now, <clears throat> that's true. That's what we want to achieve. We want to reduce reaccession rates. Um, the problem is that reaccession per se is a function of the surgical procedure itself. This paper here analyzed the spontaneous reexition rates with no, no uh, other, um, say, confounders. The spontaneous reexition rates that were observed in a large um, hospital, 54 different breast surgeons, four large centers, all cooperating, so say relatively homogeneous level of care, and they observed the reaccession rates and correlated also reaccession rates with the individual surgeon's clinical uh, caseload to find out whether experience is um, of interest here. That's what they found. The spontaneous reaccession rates between surgeons vary anywhere between 0% and 70%. 0% possibly the surgeon, you know, does only mastectomies. And 70% somebody who's really, really, really trying to be an organ preservation surgery. Um, more importantly, the reaccession rates were unrelated to the individual surgical practical experience or caseload. In other words, they are just a matter of individual surgical style. The huge variations of individual surgeons' practice patterns will confound or likely override any impact of diagnostic imaging on surgical outcome. It is literally impossible to have improved diagnosis shine through this extreme variation of an outcome metric. Which is uh, the reason I assume that the trials that have been conducted before the Colmes trial, the Monet trial, which were randomized controlled clinical trials on the use of MRI for treatment planning, were negative, did not found an improved um, number, a reduced number of reaccession with using MRI. For the Colmes trial, another confounder was the fact that, but, uh, was the fact that uh, in that trial, none of the trial sites were able to do MR-guided localization nor MR-guided biopsy, which means that surgery was needed to obtain biopsy proof of additional imaging findings that MRI made. So it is very difficult to reduce the number of surgical interventions if surgery is needed to know about the um, type of disease because no you know, needle biopsy um, capacity was available. So these trials were negative. That, you know, predictably, they failed, which leads to the fact that in the year 2019, none of the guidelines worldwide recommend breast MRI for treatment planning. 
in women scheduled for breast conserving surgery. This is a nightmare for women. And this means that the re-excision epidemic will continue. And it also means that the people, not radiologists, will still wait more until improved imaging methods um, are available to depict the extent of disease. Do you feel my pain? <laughs> this is where we are in value-based healthcare. It is ridiculous. In every single case where women need to embark for surgery for a tumor that is not exactly visualized on mammography or ultrasound, it's a nightmare, I tell you. It might be less of a nightmare for the surgeon, but for the women, it's a nightmare. Because when the margins are positive, nobody knows whether it's just a single small layer of additional tissue that needs to be removed, or whether there's you know, a bulk of tumor still in the breast. And it's, nothing is more frightening than not e being able to see the enemy, so to speak. <clears throat> so, the clinical impact of diagnostic imaging, in my personal opinion, is to provide information, not more and not less. The information that should be accurate in the ideal case, and it should be clinically relevant, meaningful to prescribe and tailor treatment. To identify individuals who require treatment by screening or characterize disease, map local extent, you name it, you got it, with many clinical applications. Now, the problem is, that radiologists are not aware of the fact that value-based healthcare will make their life really difficult because you know radiologists know that they their work is very important. One uh, you know one um, symptom is that we you know can't go away. <laughs> we can't go a day off or so and leave our colleagues alone because you know the entire you know university hospital won't work without radiologists, not a single day, not even a single hour. So we know that our work is impactful. The challenge is not to be impactful, the challenge is to measure this impact. This is a problem. How do you measure knowledge? <laughs> or how do you measure the utility of knowledge? The problem is that between the diagnosis, the investigation, and the outcome, the outcome that are usually used in clinical trials, like surgical outcome, re-excision rates, or oncological outcome, like re recurrence rates or survival rates, there are confounders. And these confounders are the surgeon, <laughs> and then the surgeon plus the oncologist plus the radiotherapist plus you name it regarding the oncological outcome. So that, you know, the outcome and the accuracy with which we work is greatly diluted, and we can't control this. This is the exact reason why the Oxford Center of Evidence-Based Medicine, in its wisdom, doesn't even ask for this type of outcome to justify the use of diagnostic tests. Let me explain. This is um, the type of evidence that the Oxford um, Center of Evidence-Based Medicine distinguishes. You are pre um, probably all aware of the fact that we distinguish between different levels of evidence, you know, highest level is level one, lowest level is expert opinion or level five, but it also distinguishes different types of, say, applications or interventions, so to speak. It distinguishes between diagnostic tests and treatment. So it distinguishes between the type of evidence that is required to justify the use of new diagnostic tests as opposed to the type of evidence that is needed to justify new treatment approaches. For a new diagnostic test, the question to be answered by clinical trials are, is this diagnostic test or treatment monitoring test, treatment monitoring, there's the word, treatment, we monitor treatment, but we don't do treatment. That's a difference, okay? So diagnosis or treatment monitoring tests are accurate. This is what we should pro prove, nothing more. But as opposed to um, inter um, uh, therapeutic uh, trials where we want to find out whether the intervention, the treatment helps and whether it has harms, frequent harms and rare harms. This is what people need to find out 
before new treatment um, trials or new treatment um, um, approaches can be integrated into clinical medicine. Using pre uh, MRI in the preoperative situation for extent of disease is the classical case of a diagnostic test. It's not a screening situation whatsoever. It is all diagnosis. It's going to guide treatment. It is no treatment. Treatment, guiding treatment is no treatment. <laughs> Very simple. For introduction of a new diagnostic test, therefore, the Oxford, uh, sorry, the um, Oxford Institute of Evidence-Based Medicine accepts diagnostic accuracy as the appropriate outcome metric, not impact on treatment outcome. And it is so wise because it knows that there are the confounders. So if we want to do outcome research and want to join our clinical partners to, um, you know, um, provide evidence according to the requirements of evidence or uh, um, value-based healthcare, then we either have to effectively control confounders, know what our surgeons do, don't let them work as they want, but prescribe them to the latest and greatest detail what they need to do, don't know how um, feasible this is going to be, or find robust outcome metrics that are independent of these confounders also quite difficult. Now regarding the outcome metrics that I listed in the beginning, there are some that are, so to speak, are within our rearm. And that is all those that are um, useful for screening. These ones here, including mortality, because you know that also usually includes treatment of patients, will be confounded by treatment or types of treatment and will be much more difficult to prove a positive outcome on. So for preoperative MRI, for instance, the ongoing MIPA trial by Francesco Zanelli from Milan has the following outcome. This uh, um, slide was given to me by Francesco. They will look at change in surgical plane, I name planning, mastectomy rates and reoperation rates, and we'll also use like, uh, for, uh, um, look at the recurrence, uh, local recurrence and disease-free and overall survival. So I can only pray that this trial is going to be positive. I don't expect it to be. If it's not going to be positive, then we have another international prospective clinical trial that will add to the existing knowledge that MRI is not useful but will do harm. <laughs> Um, monitoring neoactive and systemic treatment is another application. <clears throat> Predict who will respond to treatment. This is something where Nola Hilton has done pioneering work, um, where MRI is integrated in large prospective controlled, and that's the emphasis, controlled clinical trials for, um, to find out whether um, um, uh, whether MRI can predict who is going to develop a pathological complete response. Now, this does address oncological outcome, but in this scenario here, it's completely controlled because the medication is controlled, the timing of the medication is controlled, no individual style is um, a problem. So here, for this application, we control confounders. And that's why all these trials are beautifully positive in that MRI is useful for prediction of who is going to achieve pathological complete response. Uh, we also have um, evidence that um, uh, diffusion-weighted imaging is an important biomarker for this purpose. We know that uh, we can even um, prognosticate, in other words, know who is going to um, do well after treatment if we use the degree of response as depicted by breast MRI under neoadjuvant chemotherapy as a metric and then correlate with final patient outcome. And then we can, uh, she has also shown that we can use this for drug development, in other words, rapid identification of candidate drugs, you know, rather than you know, going through all rounds of the clinical trial, the pharmaceutical industry uses um, the MRI response to then identify promising candidates 
and um, uh, stop the further um, clinical trial and development of candidates that do not induce an effect on functional MR imaging. MRI for breast cancer screening to help detect individuals who require treatment is actually a nice application and, so to speak, an easy task for us because we control the outcome. An important um, uh, example is the DENSE trial that was just concluded and is under publication, hopefully, in the New England Journal of Medicine soon. <laughs> Um, the um, uh, trial outcome metrics uh, was um, to a cancer detection rate, interval cancer rate, and costs. And these are um, uh, metrics that we control, and we're not, they're no confounders at all. And uh, I think it's not, um, uh, I, I think this sneak preview, so to speak, is acceptable because this was uh, published by the authors themselves on last, uh, this year's um, ECR. Um, the dense trial uh, concentrated on the um, small group of women with very dense breasts and had a cancer detection rate uh, of 16.5 per thousand, which is quite high. But more importantly, they had a five-fold lower interval cancer rate in other words, five-fold less often failed screening compared with, the same, with women undergoing mammography for screening. This is a quantum leap. It's not just a bit better, it's a quantum leap. The BRAID trial um, conducted by uh, Fiona Gilbert will um, um, recru um, include 12,000 women and then randomize them to either to different types of MR imaging for screening be it mammography or um, uh, whole breast ultrasound, automated ultrasound, abbreviated MRI, or standard of care. And here the outcome metric is clearly someone, uh, clearly an outcome that we will control. So that trial is predictably going to be um, interesting and helpful to find out what type of screening is suitable for what, um, for, uh, for what type of breast density. Completed trials are the abbreviated breast MRI screening trial that we published in 2014, where we could show that a greatly abbreviated protocol is um, equivalent uh, to a full protocol and allows cancer detection with the same cancer detection rate as does full protocol MRI, and is also associated not only with a short examination time, but most notably with a short reading time of only a couple of seconds per radiologist, which is why abbreviated MRI for screening is likely a, a, a perfect alternative for also um, screening on a broader scale. Since we published this in 2014, an entire range of trials have been conducted worldwide where people uh, used this idea um, to confirm uh, what we did. And I'm proud to say that we have now data on over 7,500 women, over 900 cancers. And all of the trials are uh, concordant in that uh, the um, detection rate is equivalent if you use abbreviated as opposed to um, full protocol MRI. So that is the new way to proceed. Um, that led to the fact that um, ECOC Akrin sponsored our abbreviated breast MRI screening trial on the um, Chris Comstock as a PI with Glenn Newstead and myself serving as co PIs. This paper is also now under submission. Pray for us, it's going to be accepted. Um, I don't know, um, I still, you know, so wait, it's now six years, six weeks, felt like six years, six weeks under review. Um, so hopefully, going to be um, published soon. What I can tell you now is that the results are greatly say, reproducing what we um, found out in 2014. Only now it's on 48 different trials uh, sites, uh, um, including also sites who had no specific experience with breast MRI, so like community practice. And, um, and it was actually um, interesting to so the cancer detection rate is our primary aim. Nice thing also was that recruitment was double as fast as anticipated, so it seems that women like the idea of undergo screening with MRI. So um, the problem is that we don't have in, um, in information on mortality. Now, uh, does that mean that we have to stay on the bench? I mean, do like MRI and ultrasound have to stay on the bench? Because only mammography has been shown by prospective randomized trials to have an impact on breast cancer mortality as the final outcome, so to speak. And no such evidence is available and will be available for my lifetime, at least, for the other candidate methods. So do we just have to wait? 
The argument is only mammography has an impact, a certain established impact on breast cancer mortality. Therefore, that's what I hear, we cannot offer non-mammographic screening methods for which this evidence is lacking. I think this is not, I mean, I think another interpretation is also possible, and that is the reverse interpretation. Because we have knowledge about the fact that mammography does improve survival. We can use non-mammographic imaging um, for screening. The trials from the 1970s were not done to investigate the diagnostic accuracy of mammography. Rather, they were designed to prove that early diagnosis is useful in breast cancer. You may remember, or not, maybe you haven't even been born during that time, that at that time, um, breast cancer was considered to be a primary systemic disease and that early diagnosis would not matter. So what they did with these trials is to find out whether the concept of early diagnosis works. And the concept was working. Early diagnosis does translate into a survival benefit. So it's not a primary systemic disease. And improved early diagnosis will then likely yield improved modality reduction. So we can use the known effect of mammographic screening, which is there, and model the known effect of MRI versus mammography in terms of cancer detection rate, but also type of cancer detection detected, to then model, use bio stand, standard methods of bioinformatics um, to model the mortality reducing effects of non-mammographic screening. Yes, we can, that's my conclusion. Yes, we can use screening methods that offer a higher cancer detection rate and a more advantageous sensitivity profile because they will have a greater impact on breast cancer mortality. So to conclude, the challenge of radiology in this era of value-based medicine, if you want to survive and don't suffer the pains that we go through with preoperative breast MRI, we have to keep in mind that diagnostic imaging, just as pathology, by the way, where, where no, nobody asks about pathology to have an impact on outcome. Just as pathology, radiologists in the diagnostic imaging part of their job provide information, not treatment. Of course, a diagnosis is important for any treatment. However, how successful this information is used, how good the outcome of treatment is, depends greatly on the skills of the ones who deliver that treatment. A fool with a tool is still a fool. Okay. Now, then radiologists seem to me full of enthusiasm about value-based healthcare because they know that their impact on modern medicine is huge. However, they ignore that although their impact is large, it is difficult to measure this impact. Full of enthusiasm, they willingly agree to undergo analyses that were designed to evaluate outcome of medical and surgical disciplines. Radiologists must get involved in clinical trials and develop appropriate outcome metrics that help evaluate their contribution, or we will fail. This uh, quote from Bertolt Brecht for the very end, nur die dümmsten Kälber wählen ihre schlechter selber, only stupid calves happily choose their own butcher. So be aware. Thank you very much. <laughs>